Hey, hey, it is Karen Monique here, and I want to welcome you to my channel if you are new here. My channel typically focuses on helping those in the fashion space or aspiring designers who want to design their footwear or handbag lines do it without going to school. But in today's video, we actually are focusing on some grief stuff, things around um, loved ones we have lost, because God laid it on my heart not too long ago to start a series around grief and really talking about the grief journey. So in today's video, I'm actually going to give you five tips that can help you during the funeral planning process while you are immediately grieving that brand new feeling of grief after you have lost that loved one. So if you are not already subscribed to my channel, please subscribe to this channel. Please like this video. Feel free to share this video. Give it a thumbs up for sure and uh, leave me a comment if you have any questions or even if you just love it. So let's jump right into this video. the immediacy of feelings that come when we lose a loved one, all of them vary. They're so different depending on who you are, depending on how that person may have passed away, depending on what kind of headspace you're in. There are so many factors that really impact what it is or how you might be feeling. Um, I know when my mom died, my mom died in June of 2021, when she died, I had already started to grieve my mother because she was on life support. My mother was sick and it was going downhill. So I began to grieve her before she even passed away. And my grief process for me specifically, it was a feeling of relief. And I say that with a little bit of caution, but my mother, me and my mother were really close. And to see her in pain caused me a lot of pain, even physically, I had headaches. The week that they started to tell me that like it's not looking good, I remember my body physically becoming achy. Um, I really did not feel well. So a lot of my grief was very external. Um, I didn't do a lot of crying. Um, I'm a planner. I kind of went into planning mode. I went into support mode thinking about my brother and my cousins. Uh, my cousins really loved my mom. They called her Auntie Mama. My mom was like the go-to person in the family. So that is where my mind went. So I also recognize that my grieving process and some of the things that I mentioned may not be what you are experiencing, but I still wanted to honor what God has placed on my heart and share a couple of things that I think could help or things to even consider when you are getting ready to plan services for a loved one, or if you know someone that you need to support who may be planning services. So I am about to drop five things from my experience and my perspective. So the very first one is to plan a service or a ceremony around what they loved and who they were every single day. So a lot of times we want to create these standard kind of customary celebrations of life or funerals, uh, for lack of a better term, that are just this like black and white preacher gets up, does some scripture, somebody sings a song, there's a eulogy, we cry, we bury, and we go home. And that is not, it does not have to be that way. Remember, it is a celebration of life for whomever it is that you lost. So for me, one of the things that was very, very helpful, and I have my mom's obituary right here. My mom was a teacher her entire life. My mom taught longer than I've been alive. My mom was a teacher for 38 years when she passed. She actually taught. She went to work the Friday. She fell on a Saturday. That's what sent her into the hospital. She worked on Friday. She taught her class on Friday. But what we did was we decided to honor my mom. Her celebration of life was themed. And it was themed in this way because my mom literally spent almost 40 years, five days a week, working with students and children. So we themed it Miss Miss Brenda Tolbert's final class session. And the reason being, my mom was very creative, um, and not like an artist, like a like a someone who could draw. My mom was creative in terms of like, you ever met someone who you have just a very simple idea? It might be, hey, let's have a cookie drive. My mom could take that cookie drive and turn it into some type of festival that attracted so many people that you would never even think. Uh, my mom could take kids' projects 
and turned them into literal works of art, things that people wanted to frame. She just was very, very creative. And one of the things that really helped me and my brother in planning her celebration was to do it in the way that she would have done it, how she operated. My mom operated in creativity all the time. So we did a celebration of life that was themed and it had a class session. So we, instead of like, this would have been um, date of birth, and then this would have been, you know, when they passed away, we did her first lesson was her birthday and her final lesson was her date of uh, death. And then we did the funeral um, arrangements and we called the um, greeting of the family. I forgot what, what that's called, family time, or whatever. But we called it family time because in my mom's class, she had a portion of her class was called family time. She had another portion of her day where they called it circle time. So we wanted to incorporate just some of the things that she did. And then class begins at 11 a.m. But that was the, the start of her actual ceremony was at 11 a.m. So that was really helpful for us because planning her celebration of life became fun. And I say that because my mom was fun. She was not this drag of a person. And I know to honor her life, she didn't want us sitting around writing a program in obituary that was going to be super sad and super, super, super horrible uh, for in her eyes. So that was really, really helpful. We laughed and joked when we were doing it, uh, being able to be creative and thinking about all of the impact she had, how many students um, she impacted, how many people she had met in 38 years working, you know, in different schools and stuff. We just really wanted that to be highlighted because that is who my mom was. So I highly recommend that you think about what it is that they did, how they lived their life. And that will truly, truly help or could help, shall I say, that could truly, truly help in making what feels like a very daunting process because funeral and celebration of life planning can be daunting. It may ease up some of that pain because the focus is really on them and not the work of the task. My second recommendation is to actually allow other people to love on them. I know in a lot of families when a loved one is lost, there can be animosity, there can be chaos, there can be anger, there can be so many things, there can be a lot of discourse, but allow people who were in their lives to honor and remember them. And there are several ways you can do that. Allow people to write about them. I know we want to control everything that's written on the internet, we want to control everything that's put inside of the obituary program. We want to control every single narrative around our loved one, but the reality is, is that that loved one existed to so many people in so many different capacities. And we, it really, really helps for you not to carry the burden of trying to um, normalize or create one single narrative for everyone who experienced this person. Now, I'm not saying that you should allow people to talk bad about your loved one. I'm not saying people should be bashing or if something tragic happened, that that should be publicized because you don't necessarily need to relive that. But there are folks who literally are going to want to show love. There are folks who are going to want to post pictures. They're going to want to possibly have something to say at the program. They're going to want to have something to write into the obituary about that loved one. As much as you're able to, allow other people to love on them. The other thing that that really does for you or could do for you is it's a reminder of how much that person was loved, how many people cared about them because the absence of someone, like pain from the absence of someone shows that there was love. So one of the things we did in my mom's obituary for her, like for people to write uh, to her or you know how you write like a love note or whatever to them we did it in a stencil because uh, my mom taught you know kids how to write and uh, we allowed cousins my first cousins to write her sisters to write like we didn't really limit and our family's not super huge but we allowed all of the folks who we know my mom like these are her people we allowed them to have something in the obituary or have a place on the program. Um, not only did it allow for folks to get to know my mom in other ways, other relationships that she had, it took a lot of the burden off of me for having to write every single thing that had to go into the program or get up and give nine to 12 speeches or whatever, however you were planning that program. So that is my second word of advice um, 
that could be helpful for you. My third one, and this is going to be pretty pivotal, and I don't even think this is going to matter in the grief process. I think just in all of the things that happen around celebration of life planning and funeral planning, let the most logical and reasonable person handle cause and financial decisions in immediacy. And the reason I say that is um, if you are planning to do a celebration of life through like a traditional funeral home, working with like a traditional church, that kind of thing, it happens pretty fast. You're going to probably have a ceremony within two weeks meaning money's going to be due. So if this person, the loved one was insured, someone needs to contact the insurance company. Oftentimes the beneficiary is going to be the person that's able to collect money or whatever that is. But if there are multiple beneficiaries, the one that knew the most information about the person, knew the address, knew the social security number, all those things, the person who is going to have the most logical head to get the business done, put gripes aside, Put who's the oldest aside, let that happen. So for me and my brother, that was me. I am a pretty big stickler and executor. My brother is really good too at stuff like that, but my brother is also pretty mild mannered, goes with the flow kind of thing, and we needed to move fast. So me and my brother agreed, you know, I'm gonna handle the business stuff and then I'll I'll fill you in. And, but we made decisions together, but ultimately I was the one making the phone calls because I could get on the phone, get the stuff handled, know what time and date something was coming or where we needed to be for things like that. And then I was able to also delegate, like my mom needed an outfit, let my aunt do that. Um, my, she needed jewelry to go with that outfit. Some of my friends, two of my friends actually went and shopped for my mom's, um, jewelry for me and my brother and my sister-in-law and my husband, we did we all uh, agreed on a casket. So you can definitely collaborate and include folks in stuff, but there are some decisions that have to be made kind of immediately. Like someone's name, for example, has to go on the death certificate as soon as the death, like as soon as that person died, who's claiming in a sense this body. Um, whoever that is, let that be that person. So that was me. Um, but anybody can go pick up the death certificates. Like my brother, we needed some death certificates for some things and my brother went to pick those up, but allow the most logical and reasonable person during that time, the immediate time of having to plan the celebration of life, get this, get the loved one to the funeral home, whatever those, those moves that have to be made immediately, just allow the most logical person to do it. Um, it'll take a lot of stress and a lot of pressure off of you because they're going to ask questions that are uncomfortable. I remember when my mom died, so they let you stay with them. If they die in the hospital, we stayed like two hours. So we got to stay with her for two hours. I wasn't even, I had literally, I was pulling out the hospital parking lot. I drove myself home. I was pulling out the hospital parking lot. My phone rang. They were already asking for her eyes like that quickly. Had that been my brother, they would have got a whole different conversation than they got from me um, because, you know, there's time, like the, the eyes only last so long, that kind of thing. So I know that for me, I had to think with my logical mind about whether we were donating my mom's eyes or not, opposed to, oh my God, I'm still processing that my mom just died um, kind of thing. So just making sure that you allow the most logical and reasonable person to take on some of those harder tasks, those phone calls, those talking to people that's going to be kind of uncomfortable up front or allow it to be, you can allow that to be a close relative or family friend, um, or someone that's not like one of the children, if it's a parent or the parent, if it's a child, whatever, some stuff is just going to be standard answers that need to be given. Um, but they don't feel good to give. So I just want to make that clear to um, you all as well. The fourth one is going to be do not feel like you have to plan every single thing within 24 hours or even a week. My mom, she passed away June 25th. That next weekend was the 4th of July. My mom has a brother in California. I did not want my uncle to miss my mom's funeral. Now, I'm not saying my uncle couldn't afford to fly in. We live in Michigan, but I'm not going to say he couldn't afford to fly in or anything. But tickets were just very expensive for that 4th of July area. Not only that, 
um, my mom has a niece and a couple of other relatives that she was close to who lived in like Vegas, some folks in Texas. She had a god sister in Texas. There were people who really needed to make arrangements that I know for a fact wanted to be there for my mom. And I wanted to allow that. Also, dealing with the cemetery during the holiday weekend was going to be very tricky. So we pushed my mom's funeral to the next weekend. And I wanted it to be on the weekend because, like I mentioned, my mom was a teacher. Her colleagues, in order for her colleagues to be able to honor her life, it would it's easier for it to be on a weekend because if every teacher is calling off, <laughs> Then there are no teachers in the school. So there were just certain things that I was willing, so I say me and my brother, because we really did a lot of stuff together, but we were willing to compromise because that was who my mother was. So do not feel like everything has to happen in 24 hours. Also, consider pricing. If you're, depending on what type of funeral you're doing, who you're going with, all those kind of things, it can get expensive and it can get expensive quickly. Um, burying someone is not cheap. Not It is not cheap at all. Um, the price tag can get really, really expensive on that. A casket alone can be pretty expensive. And that, you know, and then there's a vault that they has to go in and then the burial plot, like the, all these things, or whether you put them in a wall, there's so many things um, to think about. So do not feel like everything has to happen within 24 hours. Now, you will need to communicate with the funeral home, whoever has your loved one's physical body, you will need to communicate with them what your plan is because they have to do like chemical things, embalming, storing of the body, um, makeup. If they have to do any kind of reconstruction, those kind of things, it is very helpful for them to know, but do not let funeral homes pressure you into, you have to do this tomorrow. That is not necessarily the case. You have a little bit of time to process the fact that you lost a loved one and to make proper decisions for that loved one. And the last one, I would say, depending on how your loved one passes um, or where, oftentimes you are going to be offered quite a few things. You might be offered a therapist, you may be offered a counselor, you may be offered a chaplain, if it's like at the hospital or something, take them up on their offers of even if it's a conversation, if it's a prayer, if it's a moment to sit with someone who's unattached. When I tell you, so I had a chaplain, the, the chaplain came twice actually uh, the day they came when they found out we were taking mom off, like they came earlier in that day to check and then they came right after mom passed. They prayed with us while she was still in the room, all of that. But that helped me and my brother um, because one, we couldn't pray in that moment and we are people of faith. We love God. But in that moment, prayer was not where we were, but it was what we needed. So whatever it is, whether you're spiritual or not, it might not even be prayer. Maybe you need to seek out a therapist, someone you, even if you have one to two sessions within that first week that that loved one passes away, because you now have to go from while you're grieving them and really experiencing this new lack of presence, physical presence from them, you have to also think about them all the time while you're planning their services. They're the person and the thing that's on your mind. They're on everybody else's mind too. Now the world is going to move on at some point and you're still going to be grieving. But in that those first couple of weeks when you lose a loved one, everybody is surrounding you. There's so much love. There's so much food. There's so much, all these things, but you need folks who are unattached. You really will. And the reason I say that is because you can say things to people who are unattached, especially professionals in confidence, that it doesn't change any experiences that you've had with your loved one. It does. There's no judgment on how you feel. No one is processing that relationship that you have with that person. It really, really is impactful. You are, you cannot forget about you in the process of losing a loved one and preparing um, to send them to, you know, whatever kind of resting place it is that you choose. So I know that these can be rough to kind of resonate with, one, if you haven't experienced loss yet, or even if you've never really thought about the funeral process or the celebration of life process. But I still wanted to put this video out to help someone who may be experiencing this or soon be experiencing this or one day experience this because I 
went into all of this blind and it is a lot when someone passes away. There's a lot that happens within that first week to two weeks um, while their body is still above ground, essentially, or, you know, while, while their body is still in the hands of caretakers. So I hope and I really, really pray that this video helped you. I pray that if you have lost someone or if you are in the grieving process, that these tips are something that you can use or you can share. And I really look forward um, to continuing to share my grief journey and tips that have helped me that could possibly help others as they navigate. So I'm going to finish this off with a super quick prayer and uh, we will get on out of here. God, I come to you right now just saying thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and the platform to be available to share what I have experienced and what feels like such a hard, hard time. God, I thank you for wisdom and I thank you for allowing my voice to resonate with folks who need it. Lord, I ask you to cover whoever is on the other side of this video, Father God. Bless their spirit and their soul to know that their loved one lived a well-lived life, Father God. Allow the memories of joy, happiness, and wholeness to consume and fulfill them as they navigate this grief process, God, and be with them through it in its entirety, through the entire process. Lord, if they are currently planning services for a loved one, Lord, allow it to be easy, not only in the physical planning and the financial realm, in the spiritual realm, but also with everyone they come in contact with. Lord, let there be no animosity. God, let there not be any push or pull on them. Let everything that they want for their loved one to happen, Father God. And I thank you right now that life and love existed because that is why we grieve. And I ask all these blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please remember to like this video, to subscribe to my channel, to share it with someone who may need it. And if you really loved it, leave me a comment. And I will see you all in the next video.